a lot of times when there are the CVEs and the VPNs, sometimes it is kind of like open season uh, for the ransomware groups where they're just specifically targeting those uh, at, at a high volume. So we're going to get into some case studies now. Um, and in both of our case studies, they, they start with the, that as the initial act access is you know something related to the VPN and the first one I'm going to walk through here is Akira ransomware um, so this is one that we started seeing an increase in Akira it in Q4 unfortunately we've continued to see that in Q1 so this still seems to be some active campaigns um, and they do seem to be targeting uh, you know VPNs that that aren't enforcing multi-factor authentication and also it seems to be focused on the Cisco ASA devices which there is a CVE uh, that is connected to those ones I think that was published in October and that seems to be what this group is targeting so in this particular case once the actor got in uh, through the VPN uh, the actor was able to maintain persistence via a remote management monitoring tool. In this case, it was AnyDesk, so they were using legitimate tools to maintain persistence. Um, and they conducted some internal network discovery using NetScan. Um, in this case, in, in all the cases that we've observed with Akira, there has been some element of data exfiltration. And in those cases, they have been using WinSCP for that exfil and also WinRAR for compression. We also see they are using leveraging a remote desktop protocol or RDP to move laterally across systems. And once they have escalated their privileges to domain admin level privileges, they are then deploying Akira ransomware. And we've seen, as I said, we've seen a lot of cases with Akira and they all seem to follow this similar fact pattern. And we're also following a lot of reporting from other IR companies that are reporting the same activity. And I do believe that CISA actually put out a warning about that this, this week, specifically related to that Cisco ASA uh, vulnerability that I mentioned. So, you know, I kind of walked through this one at a high level and I'm going to have George now walk through it as well. So, you know, we always talk about initial access and initial access, you know, we want to keep actors out. So we want to lock the door. We want to lock all the windows so intruders can't get into our homes. Right. And it's the same thing for our networks. But unfortunately, sometimes in spite of the best security controls, actors still get in. So what I want to do now is kind of look at these you know, look at this case study and look at the, you know, all the things that they did here and where we have some opportunities to detect this activity and stop it before it gets to that ultimate payload. So we're just kind of going to walk us through that for the Sakira one, and then we're going to do the same for our next case study on play. Sure. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, yeah, defense in depth is, is always a, a good strategy, um, especially when it comes to uh, novel or, or, or zero day vulnerabilities where a detection may be days, weeks, or, or very hard to do. Um, and so it's best to have that those layers of defense, right? So let's take a look at initially with uh, what visibility that we can gain into our environment, um, just to give um, everyone some ideas of, of uh, areas of the network that they can be looking. Of course, uh, we, can, we can gather logs from um, our edge networking technologies. I think that's you know, what, what most organizations do, and that can be used to drive uh, some level um, of observability. Um, of course, those endpoints are a great way um, of, of, of driving detection, um, and we'll go into some of that in, in a minute. Um, of course, we've got um, the use of RDP there. That's a, that's a great um, network log source um, that we can uh, get into a, a seam um, and use that to drive detection. And we've also got the, the threat actors using um, uh, domain admin uh, level privileges. So that's typically what should be used as a, a break glass account. Um, so the fact that that uh, domain admin um, had been used uh, immediately should be, um, you know, setting off some 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 bells and whistles, some red flags there. So let's look at some places that we can uh, detect and respond to this activity. Um, what, what can we use to drive the detection? Well, of course, we've got our endpoints, endpoint monitoring tools like uh, EDR, next generation antivirus, um, if you don't use any desk in your environment, for example, immediately that should be triggering alerts. Um, internal network discovery, uh, just the, the dropping of the net scan binary, you know, all of those things can um, be alerted on um, with some, uh, you know, pretty high confidence. 
Um, moving into areas where you know we might be getting a few more alerts and a few false positives. Um, again, uh, the use of RDP, looking at that network traffic, and of course the, the use of domain admin as well. Um, and let's take a look at some of the controls that we can put in place. Uh, again, application um, applications like AnyDesk, totally legitimate application. You may use it in your environment, but if you don't, um, employ application whitelisting. Um, make it so that it's hard for the threat actors to drop that binary onto the endpoint. Similarly, for the use of uh, WinSCP um, and, and WinRAR, um, data exfiltration um, outside of the network as well, um, that can all be tightened up. Um, and if you don't use RDP in your day-to-day -day activities in your organization, um, maybe consider disabling RDP um, or, or you know, severely limiting um, the ability for, for uh, normal users to, to use it. Um, yeah, just some ideas there. I'll, uh, I'll hand back to you, Laurie. Okay, and thanks for that. And we're going to look at another case study here. And, um, you know, it's a, a different ransomware group. So that now we have play, but you're going to see a lot of similarities between the two. So a lot of the things that George just mentioned would also apply um, in, in this particular case for detection. Now, in this one, they were leveraging the Citrix bleed vulnerability to get into the network. Once they were in, uh, this time they were you know, conducting internal scoutings. They were using a series of different commands to discover and enumerate uh, accounts on the network. This time they used PowerShell to deploy tools. They were deploying things like Mimi Cats to help them obtain credentials for lateral movement. Um, and in this case, instead of using a legitimate tool like AnyDesk for persistence, they actually had a remote access Trojan that they were using. And they were also using uh, defense evasion techniques by clearing logs, stopping backups and exchange services. Uh, exfiltration occurred the same way as in the last, as did lateral movement via RDP. And then in this one, the ultimate payload was a, a play ransomware payload that was distributed via group policy objects across multiple hosts. So George, I know you already touched on the detection for some of these things, but can you take us through uh, some, some different areas uh, that were affected in this case that we might be able to detect for? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, let's look at where we can get some, some visibility. A lot of this is gonna be um, very much the same um, where we've got uh, you know endpoint devices. Um, so we need to get uh, visibility of, of the network, endpoint, um, any of our um, uh, tooling that we may be using, the Citrix in this particular case. Um, again, we've got um, RDP as well. Um, if we take a look at what uh, areas uh, we can detect and respond on, um, again, uh, the use of PowerShell, uh, Mimikatz, immediately um, that should be uh, triggering um, an alert. Um, it should be um, you know, investigated, um, identified where the, that alert has started. Um, all of that stuff uh, can be driven from really good endpoint detection response tools. Um, the, the use of a remote access Trojan in any way, um, to, uh, you would hope um, antivirus would be able to step in um, uh, in some of those places. Um, but if not, um, understanding the, the particular Trojan um, that's being used, um, some of the MITRE TTPs that that uh, particular piece of malware has to do to operate effectively um, and detect on those, again, is a really good um, good idea. Um, and of course, we've got the, the use of RDP as well. Um, and when it comes to controls, again, uh, we're, we're looking really at um, application allow listing. Um, we're looking at, uh, you know, the use of RDP here. Um, that's something that, uh, you know, most organizations probably do use, but in a limited sense. Um, and so it can be, uh, can be stopped there. And of course, um, exfiltration of data, um, if that's not a control, it can certainly be uh, an alert. If, if uh, large quantities of data are leaving your network um, from somewhere you don't expect, um, then that needs to be investigated. Back over to you, Laurie. Yeah, so George, you you were talking us through like all these different alerts that might fire off, and I know you've mentioned sometimes you know with with some of these alerts, if you it can create a lot of noise, there could be false positives. So I was actually wondering um, if you could kind of speak to I know this is a problem we all have in, in Fred Intel, but can you kind of speak to what alert what alerts can what organizations can do to about alert fatigue? Yeah, alert fatigue, uh, I think it affects everyone, right? Um, sort of a thousand yard stare to the, the time I, I spent 
uh, in the SOC, um, it can be very difficult to, to filter the, the signal from the noise. Um, I think the main sort of tips would be to, to ensure high quality detection, um, that the detection describes exactly what it's designed to detect and why that's malicious. Um, and that, that information is communicated clearly to the, uh, the SOC operators. 